right, well, thank you everyone for joining. This is very exciting to be back in person and uh, to be talking about the future of FinTech. We're gonna spend most of this panel looking forward, but I thought before we do that, we would look back a little bit because I just learned in the green room, this is actually, I think the 10 year anniversary for Plaid as a company. So I thought that we could go back to the beginning and uh, you actually wrote a Twitter thread just recently earlier this year about being an associate at Techstars New York and using that as a transition point into becoming an entrepreneur. Let's start there and talk a little about the early days of Plaid for this audience. Sure, so um, my story is a little, a little odd. I, I um, thought I was gonna, uh, is I was working in a physics lab and I thought I was gonna get a PhD in physics and then one of my friends convinced me to go um, get a job in the real world. And um, I took this consulting job and I uh, ended up in bank data centers because they said, oh, you know how to write code, you, you should go do all of our data center work. Um, I mean, it's like the, the most junior possible version. Uh, uh, and you know, you learn a lot about uh, bank technology when you're in their data centers, um, uh, and it was not very good. Um, uh, this particular bank, not all banks. Um, and then I ended up leaving because I wanted to do startup things, so I went to New York and, and took this role at Techstars and, and thought I was gonna go work for either a VC or uh, uh, work for a startup, and it, it done a bunch of interviews. Actually, funny enough, um, uh, Christina, who was just on stage, interviewed me um, at Union Square Ventures um, when I was like 21 or 22. And I, needless to say, I did not get that job. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I heard she came late to the interview too, but we won't, we won't cover it. I, 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 I honestly don't even remember. Um, but, so, uh, so it, it, like, it was being in the New York ecosystem in 2012, 2013 was like a pretty exciting, fun time. Um, I think, you know, it, it just early technology in New York, like really tightly knit community and really focused on FinTech, which was kind of odd because um, uh, the traditional VC lore at the time is that you can never build anything interesting in financial services as a startup because it's too highly regulated and there's too many big incumbents and so on and so forth. Um, it turns out that's actually like a great recipe um, uh, for building startups. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah, I had, had, had this uh, amazing time learning about FinTech and then ended up falling into kind of turning a side project, which, which was an early version of Plaid. Uh, found a bunch of uh, demand for uh, kind of what we do and then that kind of uh, kicked off the company. Let's flash forward to you now. Uh, for people that haven't followed the story as closely and maybe the product roadmap, can you just give people a sense of where is Plaid from a product standpoint today? I think people will be surprised to understand the breadth of the platform. Um, but yeah, maybe sure. uh, give a quick overview for everyone. Totally. So um, we started Plaid um, uh, with the concept that banking was built for a world that didn't envision the internet. And as such, almost everything in your financial life in 2012, when we started the company, required you to walk into a bank branch and talk to a banker. Um, and that worked very well if you lived in a big city and you had access to a lot of banks. Um, but I grew up in a small town in the middle of nowhere in North Carolina. Um, there's one bank in our town. Um, and my parents had a checking and savings account at that bank, but the bank didn't actually offer mortgages because our house was too small. Um, so they had to drive an hour into the big city in order to get a mortgage. And they were lucky because they had a car and they had the time to drive and they could you know, make the time on a weekday to actually go do that thing. And a lot of people in our community didn't have that time. Um, and then you kind of apply this, this, this problem of banking, uh, kind of financial services broadly, are not evenly distributed. Um, uh, and you, you see all these pockets of uh, kind of consumers that are underserved, consumers that don't have any access to certain things, um, loan rates that are exorbitantly high um, because there's no competition. Um, and we said, all right, well, how do we fix that? We want to build an API for your bank account. Um, and that, that wasn't necessarily a novel concept at the time. I mean, not a lot of people were thinking about it, but uh, we weren't the only ones. Um, but I think we're the only ones that like uh, actually went and did it um, and like, actually like, kind of buckled down and, and, and focused on that. Um, and so originally Plaid started out as kind of how do you connect your, your kind of bank account to a digital financial services product uh, as you might want to use. Venmo was one of our first customers, so how do you connect your Chase account to your Venmo account? Um, that's what we built. Um, and then it became how do you connect your Venmo account to your Chase account? Because Chase also started building products and, and so forth. So that's, that's, that's compounded. Um, but more recently we've launched a bunch of other things that sit kind of really at the nexus of all of the things that a fintech company needs in order to kind of uh, onboard a user and, and get started. So. Um, we have a fairly substantial identity verification uh, product um, yeah, that's gone really well. It's actually amazing because we have you know, now se the 7,000 largest uh, fintech and digital finance companies um, that are all contributing back data into this network and the, the, the network driven um, yeah, kind of identity verification is, is pretty amazing. Um, we have a risk and fraud analytics product which, which kind of sits alongside that um, so you can identify kind of bad actors or users that are, that are doing um, of nefarious things or signing up for a bunch of apps all at once or you know immediately signing up for 10 bitcoin exchanges and uh, trying to move bitcoin out so we can, we can find all that stuff um, and then we have a credit analytics team 
that, um, uh, uh, that, that helps analyze kind of uh, a consumer's ability to get a loan based on not just their FICO score, but also their, you know, their cash flow. Um, and the last one for us is we've done a bunch of work to bank payments. So how do we actually move money in and out of the bank account? So that's been um, pretty amazing to see, actually. It's been a really exciting growth area. So um, the concept is uh, anything that uh, uh, you need as a, um, uh, as, as a developer building a fintech product and um, to get a user from like, interested to uh, excited. Yeah. Uh, exciting. And uh, backstage, we were talking about the fact that you just had a hack week. I think many people here who are founders probably doing similar things. Um, that might be a nice way to start kind of talking about the future here and some of the things that Plaid is thinking about building. Maybe there are notable projects you can speak to. I'm sure a lot of it you can't speak to, but you know, maybe some trends from that hack week. We can use that as a beachhead to talk more about you know, how we're both seeing the industry move, move forward. Yeah. Um, well, I think the short answer is um, everyone should, like, if, if, in startups, you should do hack weeks, and they're, like, a pretty amazing time. They take you back to when you're two people in a room. I mean, even when we were, like, five people in a room, we did a hack week, um, uh, despite the fact that it was basically every day. Um, but it allows us to, just to think on a totally different, uh, totally different horizon. So um, this time around, we had some, uh, some, some really exciting uh, products. I think a lot of the, the themes were, like, how do we kind of inject AI into um, a lot of the different things that we're doing, um, a lot of the LLMs. I think we, we did a lot of actually image work, so um, doing image capture on identity verification documents and then like figuring out how to process them in, in, in a differentiated way. Um, that was pretty amazing. And then I think the biggest theme of things that we saw internally was just network driven products. So anything that will use the aggregate, you know, hundreds of millions of users that have linked their accounts through Plaid to drive better value for um, kind of the, the incremental user, um, uh, be that on risk or fraud or, or, or elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was awesome. And then, you know, we had all sorts of things like people, um, uh, you know, people building things for our offices. It's just um, we, we actually have. What did you go for the office? Come on, give us a fun one. Here. Like that's that's. Uh, like like so, so people went really deep on Mid Journey, and like we did a bunch of posters all throughout our office, and it was like this really really cool thing. We have our entire company do it, so you know our our um, our office staff was was like building stuff for the office on Mid Journey. So that was that was pretty cool. Okay, that's good. We we don't usually do hack weeks as VCs, but I like the idea of us Mid Journeys is like. Yeah, really superhero. That would be so much fun. All right, well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to follow up with you. I'll, I'll come in and consult. We can work together. All right, right. We, we got something going here. I like it. Okay, good. Okay. All right, let's talk about. You talked a lot about how AI had infused a lot of the direction for some of these hacking yeah. projects. I mean, that is the theme that I think everybody here wants to talk about. And certainly, as I think about the future of fintech, where AI will come and intersect is one of the, the big things we're trying to unpack here. How are you seeing that play out? Um, obviously, talked a little bit at Plaid, but maybe even more broadly within fintech. It's a good question. Um, so I, I think there's, there's like uh, wave one uh, and, and then probably wave two and eventually there'll be wave three. Um, wave one is just the, the acceleration of every process that every human does. Um, I, I, was, I was speaking with some friends and basically it's anywhere that, um, anywhere that people are spending time in a repeatable process, um, yeah, that is the thing that we're seeing people automate. So um, uh, one that is obvious within companies is uh, things like support workflows, um, uh, repeat, repetitive coding workflows. You're seeing that stuff get automated really quickly. Um, I think in financial services specifically, like accounting is a really interesting area, which which I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Um, uh, an area that uh, you know we can see it's like structured data into structured data. Um, so that's that's kind of like the wave one is just kind of the, the acceleration of processes. Um, wave two, I think, will become very very interesting. So like. When you think about the human work that is involved in fraud tagging, um, uh, there's like, an interesting way that AI can do a lot of that work and, and, and accelerate a lot of that process. Um, so we're actually trying to use it for a lot of our kind of like data management, um, uh, and this is like basic data management. So for example, take this block list um, uh, from you know, uh, uh, from, from one data vendor, take the OFAC list from another data vendor, and uh, take, take like kind of all of these, like th these are bad actor lists. Normalize them into something that's, that's useful, feed that into, in, into our model, um, and update that every second. Um, so we've written a bunch of software to do that, and they've taken humans time, but every time the format of the data changes, there, you know, so something breaks, you have to have humans redo it. Now you can just have a model do all of that immediately. Um, and so um, that's been uh, like pretty pretty amazing to see. So I think that we're going to see huge improvements in fraud. And then I'm actually really excited long term for credit underwriting and credit analytics. Um, I think that AI will have a huge impact on it, but there is a lot of regulation that it needs to get through um, before we're able to do that. So I think financial services that'll be kind of a, a huge boon. But I'd love to hear what are, what are you what are you looking at? Um, we talked about the process automation. I think that's a big area that we've been excited about. Uh, we've invested in a lot of what I would call tech enabled business models. See, so these are models where you're really trying to solve a problem and you're comfortable having a human sit next to the software. Um, I'll give you an example because you brought up accounting. 
a company called Pilot that some of you might use in the audience for bookkeeping. That's a cool company. It's a, thank, thank you, appreciate you. it. The shout out to Pilot. Um, and, and that's a company where uh, you're trying to understand where is the asymptote between what a human has to do and what the software can do. And what we're seeing with ChatGPT and other AI features is that line is moving further and further towards full automation. In a way that just really changes the customer experience and the, the kind of robustness of the business model. So we're looking at a lot of similar businesses like that. I'd put a second bucket, which I actually want to uh, push back to you of wealth management. Um, for anyone who might be building it around the space or a customer of wealth management products, um, go, to, go to chat GPT or go to your favorite large language model and ask for financial advice. It's pretty good. Um, that's yeah, as of 2001. As of, as of 2021, so be careful, that's right. Um, but it gives you pretty generic advice. And I think the, the next unlock is gonna be if you could get uh, kind of the mapping of the assets and liability for a consumer through uh, through Plaid, um, could you give specific advice? Could you say, when you see my paycheck come into my bank account, optimally route it to pay back some of my student loans and also to save for a trip that I have coming up at the end of the year? Um, so that's a, that's a thesis that I've been excited to unpack. We haven't invested on it yet, but we're looking at it. I'd be curious, do you think, like, how do you think Plaid plays into that future if that's an area you could see development? I think it's, I think it's, um, Pretty fantastic. I, I've always had this theory of a financial, like a, I think it was like a financial assistant, um, but something that has like actual real world um, capability. So um, people have asked me if I were to build another startup, what would I build? And I'd probably try to build Plaid. Um, uh, but if, if that wasn't allowed, um, I, I would, um, like I, this concept of like a financial assistant that actually like receives all your money, routes it all to all the places that you want it to go, um, and, and has a bunch of kind of real world action on top of it. I don't think we're there yet for a handful of reasons. Um, first is like there's there's major data privacy concerns. Um, we'll get through that absolutely, um, uh, but there are just data privacy concerns about piping people's data into uh, something where random humans, not random, uh, but like contractors can 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 see. Um, second is just the, the actions are not there yet, so people aren't actually fully trusting of it. If you have like a, a one percent uh, bad outcome uh, in financial services, that's actually like potentially catastrophic. Um, and so we're not yet at the point where the bad outcome probability is so low. Um, that someone won't make a really bad decision. And so it'll always be human intermediated, or at least I think it will be human intermediated for the next few years. We've seen a few people have kind of like a high degree of automation and then a human that, that, that says at the end of it, like, yeah, go, go do that thing. Um, I was looking at a company that was, that was doing that recently. Um, so I suspect we'll see a lot more there. My hunch is that um, most of the way that consumers will, will see this play out is just in the background, things are way easier. So I'm not sure if you've ever filed a, um, uh, uh, let's say you were using your Amex card, um, uh, and you filed a kind of dispute with a merchant to say, hey, this, this, this thing didn't work. Um, that form is like incredibly long, it's incredibly cumbersome, it asks you to like collect data that is actually like, you know, in systems in a bunch of different places. Like that kind of thing, I think will just be super streamlined and easy. Um, and so I think consumers will see like friction reduction first, um, and then uh, maybe like new form factors. Yeah, it's a scary thought for a, hallucina a hallucination from one of these models when it's dealing yeah. actually with money that's moving in around your account. Especially if it's a 2021 trained model in a zero interest rate environment, they're saying like, invest in, in this way. Yeah, we, we would be able to use that at Index Ventures. Um, all right, let's talk about kind of stepping back and, and I think, first off, it's great to see so many people at a future of FinTech environment when, you know, there's so much doom and gloom in this industry right now. After a really a huge boom cycle in 2020, 2021, um, the industry is really on the other side of the press cycle at this point. I'm wondering how you see it. I mean, we're like you have such a unique vantage point on this industry, given that so much of it is you know part of your customer base at this point. You can see when customers grow, when they don't. How do you see the future playing out from here? Is the doom and gloom overstated? Are we at a local max, a local minima? Like, how, how do you see the industry right now? Uh, well, if, if you're talking to any of my competitors, FinTech is over. Um, they should just shut down and go home. Uh, Got it. And, and, uh, and I wish them off. We can hop off stage. That's there it. Yeah. Um, no. Like, I, I think that um, there are absolutely cycles. There, there's been a, a, a macro cycle in, in kind of all of, uh, all of startup land, frankly, and in, in a lot of tech valuations. Um, and then within FinTech, it's, it's certainly been impacted. And for the companies that have been impacted, it's really, really hard. But what I would say is when you, when you put it on a longer horizon, when you put it on a 10 or a 20 year horizon, um, the, the goal of most financial services companies is, um, or most FinTech companies, is to digitize financial services. And if you think about the kind of average way that a consumer gets a mortgage in the United States, 
Um, uh, and granted, yes, there are less mortgages being issued this year. Um, but the average way that a consumer gets a mortgage is with a shoebox full of printed out papers. Um, it's actually 65 to 80 pages of physical documentation that a consumer carries into a bank branch and hands to uh, kind of a mortgage uh, or a loan officer. And that's, that's going to go away. Like, definitively, like, we are going, we're like, on the right, right side of, of, of the trend of digitization. Um, so long term, that's, that's absolutely going to happen. I think in the medium term, we're going to see a lot of changes in formats. Um, so uh, it could have, V1 was, we saw neobanks everywhere because uh, the banks were, were far too far behind um, in terms of the way that they were kind of presenting their digital experiences to consumers. Um, and so neobanks stepped in and, and, and made a huge difference there. Now the banks are actually doing quite a good job. Um, not all of them, uh, but in pockets you see many of the banks really leaning into building great digital experiences and um, they're rivaling the neobanks for, for, for a lot of the, the, the products that they could, could launch. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's exciting. That is, that is really good for consumers long term. Um, but now I think where you see innovation is going to happen in, in kind of different pockets. Um, we're still in this in this era. Um, people talk about um, kind of years of consolidation and then uh, kind of deconsolidation or kind of like uh, 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 having having many many companies that are doing things. Um, and we are in a simultaneous era of both, where um, every company is now kind of bundling around a specific demographic, where historically they bundled around a specific geography. So again, North Carolina is where I grew up. Um, the bank there had to offer everything to everyone in North Carolina because that's the only choice. Um, now what we're seeing is people are building um, a bundle of financial services products um, around a consumer that has a certain uh, risk profile, that has a certain um, uh, uh, you know, amount of income and that likes to do certain things. And these demographic bundles are just totally different. So it's, it's, we're still in this phase of reforming financial services. I would say the opportunity is gigantic. Um, yeah, we're still early, it's a huge industry, it's growing really quickly. And the cool parts are um, financial services is going from something that was just about banking to now we're seeing, um, we have the saying, every company is a FinTech company. Um, we're seeing retailers say, I wanna launch a wallet. Um, and in that wallet, I wanna launch my own uh, buy now, pay later. Um, and within that wallet, I also want to launch stored value and give people rewards. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to also issue a card because I want my, my loyalty card to, to exist in there. And this is becoming so common across so many different parts of financial services that it's clear, you know, instead of uh, con consolidating, we're actually seeing like a, a massive expansion. They just look different, it's a different form factor, and the consumer has a, a different type of product in front of them. Yeah, uh, I obviously have a, well, no, I have a vested interest in, in the outcome of this industry as, as do you, but I mean, to me, I step back and I think you've got a $10 trillion category that is dominated by incumbents that are largely over 100 years old. And if you think from a consumer standpoint, do I have delightful product experiences across my interactions with these incumbent institutions? I would say by and large the answer is no. And while there has been innovation, I think any, any place you feel the friction of bringing the shoebox of you know, papers that you've had to print out of bank statements, um, that's an opportunity for the next generation of fintechs. And I would say we're somewhere between the first and second inning of the transition from uh, kind of the old guard to the new guard. Um, so I'm, I'm very bullish on the category as well. Um, let's bring it back to some current events. Um, I'm sure everybody in the audience uh, was living the pain of the Silicon Valley bank collapse, especially here in the Bay Area. Um, to me, that's really created a question which I still have, don't have an answer to on how that's gonna affect the future of banking. Um, on the one hand, I think you can argue that this is a tremendous tailwind for the new guard of banks, the Mercury's, who I think are fantastic products, uh, the Brex's, the Columns, where William Hockey, your co-founder from Plaid, has- Yeah, I know that guy. You know, you know him, right? We, I met him. make a plug for him here. Or you could argue it's a huge headwind for those companies because while uh, they did have great customer onboarding experiences, there's a flight to quality and safety for folks. I'd actually be curious, raise a hand here if you're using one of the new banks and if you switched recently from the Silicon Valley crisis. Yeah, it's hard to see exactly, but I think there were a lot of people. So anyway, I'd love to hear your view on on Tailwind Headwind for the, the, the next generation of banks. Yeah, so it's actually been interesting. Um, how many of you have more than one bank account personally? Yeah, how many of you have more than one bank account professionally? There's like about half the number of that. So it, it, like, what's happening, I think, is that the way that consumers live their financial life personally is starting to be replicated in the way that small businesses, not large businesses necessarily, but small businesses start to live their, um, their financial life as well. Um, uh, and I think what Silicon Valley Bank taught everyone was that you should have more than one bank account. It's just a prudent thing to do. The cost of having more than one bank account is like pretty low. Like your, your account minimums are probably pretty small. Um, there's like some operational overhead and it's a little annoying, but um, 
uh, now what we're hearing is that people want to have a bunch of different bank accounts. Um, oftentimes they'll have um, you know, a, a bank with one of the, the GSID banks, globally systemically important banks, um, where you know, they're the banks that in, in 2008 the government bailed out. Um, so they'll have a, um, or offered bailouts to at least, um, uh, they'll have an account with, um, with one of those banks, and, and that can be your called safety account. Um, they'll oftentimes have uh, an account with a higher interest earning uh, bank, um, so one of the reasons that many people were with Silicon Valley Bank is they offered the best interest rates in the industry. Um, and so there are many banks out there that will still offer great interest rates. Um, and um, they'll make sure that those are really connected so they can move money in and out as they need to. Um, I guess say, say, say what you will about kind of the, the genesis of the, the, the Silicon Valley Bank run. Um, but the fact that people could um, move money so quickly um, I think is um, both scary because it, it led to this issue, but it's also just a testament to how much kind of like we have gone digital in, in, in our financial lives. Um, uh, people said it was a smartphone bank run, and, and that, is a, that is a very true thing. People can, 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 can take big action on, on their phone very quickly. So I think what we'll see is that a lot of people will use many bank accounts, um, and they'll pick and choose the one that they want. So maybe you're using a Mercury or a Brex because um, they have amazing uh, you know, tooling to help you um, uh, kind of do your expenses, but you also want the safety of a JP Morgan account, so you have that on the side. Um, and then maybe you have your legacy Silicon Valley bank account because you, you already have it there. Um, so we're starting to see this, this, this kind of like fracturing um, of it all. Um, I don't know what the VCs did. I, I assume the VCs also use Silicon Valley Bank. Maybe they don't anymore, but I don't think you're as... Um, we have multiple accounts too. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Um, let's quickly talk. I want to I want to save a little bit of time at the end, but let's quickly talk about some of the trade-offs and someone like... You know, when we had uh, portfolio companies that were evaluating, do you go to a Mercury or do you go to a JP Morgan? The time it would take to set up an account at JP Morgan was two to three weeks during that yep. crisis. But a Mercury, it could be 24 hours. Um, I think there's also this tension in kind of stepping back from in FinTech of uh, wanting to provide uh, time to value as quickly as possible, but in doing that, potentially open the gate to fraud, which is a vector you talked about earlier. How do you, especially from Plaid, think about that dichotomy and where Plaid might be able to help solve some of those fraud issues? That's a great question. So in opening bank accounts, we, we, we can do some basic work to, 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 to help with fraud there, um, but also like that, would, that, that requires a lot of work on, on, on the Mercury and the Brexit and all, all of those of the world that have done a, a particularly great job um, uh, building that. Um, actually, funny aside, um, I was talking to someone at uh, Morgan Stanley and they said, and, and, and I found this out later to be very true, that their team worked 24-7 that entire weekend, and they opened like a large, a very large number of startup accounts. Huh. Um, and so hearing Morgan Stanley, which I would never assume would move like kind of over the weekend startup pace, um, I really moved that fast was, was great. Wow. Um, yeah, so we, we've done a lot of work to, to, to think about fraud. I think for us, uh, we have three layers of fraud that, that we really monitor. First is the transaction level. So if someone's moving money, is that transaction going to be a fraudulent transaction? Um, there, because we've seen many billions of transactions um, occur in our system, uh, we've built a, a bunch of uh, kind of machine, le machine learning models that are able to quickly flag that. So we, we launched a product called Signal um, last year, which has been one of our fastest growing products ever. And like kind of many of the big names in, in, in fintech using it, and that's been, um, that's been great. Um, then we're kind of rolling up to account level fraud. So is, is, is this account doing things that are fraudulent in general? And then we're looking at user level fraud. And the next thing is we have uh, kind of ID verification data coming in. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, kind of customers reporting back fraud to us, so we can, can build this on a, on a networked basis. Um, and then we have the transaction data that's, that's feeding into it. Um, in general, fraud is going up. Um, and so uh, we, we believe that we can, we can build products that will really solve this. Um, however, it's going to be kind of an industry level thing that's going to happen over the, over the next year or two um, to really push on this. I think you see the stories about Zelle, you see the stories uh, that are going on out there. Um, and I think that there's kind of a, a big step change that we can all effectuate if, if, if we work together on it. Okay, we're going to run out of time. So last question, a lot of founders in the audience. Um, one piece of advice, you're 10 years into the journey at Plaid, that you give to someone. You talked about, people ask you all the time, what's the, the next startup you'd start? Uh, but what would you give? Just this one. Just this one. But for everybody else, what's the advice you would give uh, now a decade in? Yeah, I, I have two pieces of advice. The first one is uh, probably the most important, which is just don't die. Um, no, I'm serious. Like, it turns out you'll build a successful company if your company doesn't die. Um, for long enough. Now, there are some edge cases where, like, you know, you've heard of the cockroach startup, which is like building a bad business is never actually going to go anywhere. Like, sure, maybe you actually should stop doing that. 
um, uh, if you're in one of those cases. Um, uh, but it's pretty rare that you're in those cases. Like if, you, if you believe you have some fundamental customer insight um, and you work on it long enough and you like fight through all of the things that you have to fight through and you simply just don't die for another year, another year, another year, like you will actually end up building a big company. Um, and this is one of the things, like Plaid is a horribly difficult founding journey um, early on. Like the first three or four years of Plaid, like there were a bunch of situations in which we should have died. Um, but my co-founder and I, William, we just had this agreement, like it's not gonna die. Like we know it's not gonna die. And then at some point it's going to be successful. Like you'll keep pivoting and working and so on and so forth. So um, uh, simply just like don't, don't, don't die. Um, and then this, the second corollary to that is like don't kill yourself. Like um, uh, it is a long journey. Um, uh, and so like uh, working at insane hours all the time, yes, it's mostly required for a while, but like uh, also ensure that you, know, you can do it for the 10 years or 20 years that, that's required of it. So um, don't die is the, the most important one I have. <laughs> I feel like we're ending on a rather morbid note, but it was very good advice. So, uh, you know, like, don't be morbid. <laughs> Stay away from more bitterness. That would, that would be a bad outcome. Fantastic. Zach, thank you so much for, for joining me on stage here. Thank you to Startup Grind, and uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you.